it's changed my perception of what I think someone is capable of doing whilst also saying they love someone. It might not be the case that everybody's seen your pictures, but in your head, everybody's seen those pictures. I doubt every single man. I do not trust anybody. The paranoia is crippling. That's what other people have done. My name is Yinka Bocchini, and I'm looking into the murky topic of revenge porn. Most have heard of it. Some of us have even been warned to not send nudes. But how much do we really understand about it? In 2015, a new law to stop revenge porn was passed in the United Kingdom, not only raising public awareness, but also landing over 200 prosecutions in the first year. To understand more, I am travelling to meet survivor and activist Falami Priye. After her own experience, Falami decided to set up an organisation called Voice, standing for victims of internet crime. So Falami, how did you set up Voice? Okay, so Voice basically stands for victims of internet crime. It came about when I was a victim. It's like a, a platform where people can come, get advice. Once they make contact with me, I build that relationship with them and I will help them through the process because obviously I've gone through it. So I don't mind anybody who wants to talk to me. They can contact me anytime. It doesn't matter. I work a full-time job, but I will give the time to anybody because I know what it's like to be in that state. When um, I went through that, there wasn't a revenge porn law. There was nothing in place. There was nobody I can go to. The police didn't know I had to take my photographs down. I had to do it myself. Do you know what I mean? So there was no support mechanism at all. How did it feel to have images that you had sent someone publicised? I thought, I'm angry, and I was really angry, and that's why I decided to speak out, because I'm thinking, no way, you are just messing with the one woman. How dare you do that to me? And I mean, to the point where we were going to get married, right? We picked up the rings, you name it, we done it. And what would you say to the people who say, you know, the age old, well, if you don't want it out there, don't put it, it's a, it's a rhetoric that irritates me to mm. say the, the least. I've never said to people, do not take the pictures. Who am I to tell you, up another person, don't take the pictures and I take pictures myself. To me, it's about understanding the, the, what can happen if you do. It's about the consequence. This is what can happen. What changes do you think should be made to the law? Definitely to change the name from revenge porn, because it's a disgusting name and it actually doesn't fit the crime at all. Yeah, because it's the porn aspect <laughs> as well, isn't it? It is. Because like taking aspect. a little sexy selfie, yeah. I don't feel like exactly. that comes under the, the, the terms. And when you look at pornography, people consent to take pornography. But I don't give consent, you know, that's, it's a whole different ball game. There needs to be a big discussion and it needs to happen at schools, it needs to happen, you know, at certain places with, with, with across the board, men and women, young and old, it just needs to be across, because it's not just young people doing it. I'm in my 40s, you know, I did it when I was in my 40s, it's just like, hey, you know, age doesn't come into it, it's not a gender specific thing, it's, it's, it's just everybody does it. It's so interesting to hear from Falami that it could essentially happen to anyone. This misconception that it only happens to you if you're a young celebrity is just not true. So we're off to go and meet a lady called Anna and I really wanted to talk to her because she had revenge porn done while she was in a relationship by her partner and you know we're told not to send nudes online, not to send them on apps, not to store our sensitive material in the cloud and she's done everything that you know is right, everything that she's told to do, followed all the advice and, and it still happened. So can you start by telling me what, what happened? So I was in a relationship with a guy, like he was my boyfriend for a year. And it ended because I sort of found out he'd been cheating on me, but there was also revenge porn. Like he had been sending photos and videos of me, like having sex with him or naked or whatever that I had sent to him um, to like other women. And there were like five different women he was like routinely sending stuff of me to for like the whole relationship. When you saw that he was sharing images of you yeah. with other other women, yeah. what was that the immediate feeling that you had? Horror. Like absolute horror. This was someone who I would share my bed with every night and would tell me he loved me and so deeply and we shared so much of ourselves with each other and 
that was like, oh, I want to be married in the next few years. When should we think about having kids? And to then see all of that stuff, it was like, it was like he was two different people. It took time. I didn't think straight away, this is revenge porn. Like I knew how it felt and I knew how shocked and horrified I felt. And it was like, not till the next day where I was like, wait, isn't this illegal? Does it change the way that you view guys or are you nervous getting into something new now? I just, I associated it with like ex-partners. So this happening, it felt like my world was caving in because I had never really comprehended that you can be in a relationship with someone and then do that to you. And it's sort of, to me as well, it dispels all these myths about don't send pictures and videos to people you don't really know and, and don't be like slutty or whatever. And it's like, well, I was in a loving relationship with this one person and it still happened to me. Doing this has made me realise that all of these people and all these different types of experiences are just bunched together under one title, you know? And it's, it's really upsetting because each and every individual case is unique. Before I started doing this journey and before I started learning about it, I literally thought it was, you go out of someone, you annoy them, they upload your images. And the fact as well is that I've taken photos and I've sent photos to people and I've done so completely and utterly believing that it's an exchange between two people and that's what it should be. I don't feel like this fear that I currently have is gonna go away anytime soon because clearly you don't know anyone. To me, it seems like some men are using these images to shame women for their sexuality. Even in schools and on the radios, adverts seem to be targeting women to warn them of sending explicit images, even in confidence. While statistics do show that women are more likely to be victims, this can make male survivors feel left out of the conversation. So I decided to meet a man who became a victim. Due to concerns about privacy and stigma, he wanted to remain anonymous. So can we start from the beginning and just tell me how this all started? It was in somebody's house and I, I went over and we were taking drugs and during that point I started to notice cameras. One guy decided to go into some kind of free website where you can live stream whatever you want. When I was with somebody, say for example in a different room, the computer would come round with the live streaming and I even saw myself on the computer. You're naked, you might have parts of your body that you're not pleased about. You might have people taking photos of you doing drugs or whatever. So it's not even just porn or revenge porn. It's actually other images that are not related to the sex that you don't want people to see. So for me, it's a bigger issue than just naked bodies. I didn't realise voyeurism was an illegal activity, that it comes under kind of like a revenge porn type thing, I suppose, because you have people who can watch you having sex and you don't know. There's a lot of gay men out there who don't want to be recognised because of their jobs, because of their family, and we should have that right. I think like anybody should have that right. We need to get it out there that we should be able to have sex with whoever we want, however we want, without fear of being shamed. While listening to all of these stories, I have been struck by the lack of consent. To me, it feels like we're talking about digital sexual assault. Unsure of whether or not that was a thing, I decided to journey down to Anglia Ruskin University to chat with Dr. Tanya Horek. Tanya and Anglia Ruskin University are specialists in research on digital violence. So I wanted to find out if this was a new problem brought about by improvement and access to modern technology. In the digital age, images of sexualized and gendered violence circulate in public spaces in a way that I don't think I ever could have predicted when I initially began researching the topic. Do you think that this is a historic problem or a, a new age issue? Well, although the digital delivery of these images is new, the misogynistic treatment and the circulation of misogynistic images of women has a really long, long history, unfortunately. So it's nothing new in that regard. What is new is the forms of digital delivery. Anyone can be a victim of so-called revenge porn or image-based sexual abuse, although it is a gendered crime and the majority of victims do tend to be women. I think it's 95%. So when it comes to the name, the term revenge porn, is there a problem with that? The term revenge porn is actually quite problematic. 
First of all, the notion of porn has certain connotations that I think are quite misleading and not very helpful. Second of all, the idea of revenge is equally problematic because when you use the term revenge, it seems to suggest that the victims are somehow responsible for the images of themselves circulating online. And there's this idea that whoever is the victim of the crime shouldn't have allowed these nude photos to be taken in the first place. And that's, that's not helpful. I think one of the things that's important to think about is how we can work to destigmatize the kind of shame associated with the circulation of these images. However, that's very hard to do in a culture that objectifies women in the way that it does. In your opinion, can the internet also be used as a, as a tool of resistance? Yes, and this is a point that I think is very important, is that although a lot of violence against women and a lot of harm comes to women because of digital culture, at the same time, digital technology provides feminists, girls, women with the tools to fight back against this kind of misogynistic violence. So you have the rise of hashtag activism, where feminists go online and say, no, we're not going to stand for this. They call out um, men who have perpetrated crimes. They name them. They shame them. And that is important, and that is a real shift from when I first started researching rape. It can seem that we're in this watershed moment, but I do wonder about the extent to which real structural change is happening, because you still see so many cases where there aren't any, there isn't any legal retribution in terms of rape charges. Yeah, so so that does viral, worry me. But... Something can go viral, but and someone can tweet about it, and it can seem like change is happening, but to what extent is real structural change happening? It was really exciting to hear from Tanya about how the internet can be harnessed as a force for good. But for structural change, you may need legal impetus. As I'm still a bit unsure as to how you'd proceed in a revenge porn case, I decided to meet a lawyer to find out how helpful the current legislation is and whether it can handle the diversity of these cases. To me, it seems like this is an ever-evolving issue. And do you think the law is working quick enough to adapt and grow with social media, with people's connection with each other, with the ability to share images? There's no way, really, that the law can uh, chain, can keep pace precisely with developments in our culture, in our society, in the way we use technology and the way technology affects our lives. We will always see um, the changes and some damage before the law catches up. What advice would you give to somebody who has freshly experienced something like revenge porn? I mean, step one is don't panic, think carefully before you do anything. And I would say, if possible, go to a solicitor and try and get some advice, even if it's only advice that you get, about what your options are. So not everybody can afford to go the legal route. Is there any place they can go to find solace? Well, there, there, first of all, there, there is a problem with access to justice in this country, access to advice, let alone justice, access to information. There are organisations that are trying to fill that space. But um, unfortunately, there, there is a problem with, with access to justice um, where people um, don't have the, the means. Given the financial cost of access to justice, I started to think about how activists such as Falami are left to fill in the gaps. From the people that I spoke to, one of the recurring themes was shame and isolation. This makes the work of individuals such as Falami, who are supporting survivors through their experiences, vital. The internet was kind of used against me, in a sense, to try and embarrass and shame me, you know, with my images. But now I'm using the internet to reach out to other people, which is quite empowering, really. I'm almost like a lone ranger, in a sense, you know, I do this because I just want to make a difference. You know, there's no funding behind me. It's just me supporting people after doing a long nine to five job. And some days it is really hard, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie. But it's just a journey that you actually can't stop. I've started the journey now. And as long as I've helped one person, I'm happy. While it has been really shocking to find out the scale of these crimes, the lack of consent has been what bothered me the most. Even in the name Revenge Porn, it seems to place the blame back on the sender. In a society that projects liberalism, it's surprising how we are still allowing people to be humiliated for their nudity or sexuality. 